I am muchos excited to introduce our next guest, our keynote speaker, in fact, the lovely Matthew Mitchum. Give him a look. Woo -woo. I can't whistle, I just got braces, can't thank you. Matthew Mitchum, according to his bio, is a triple threat. An Olympic gold medalist, acclaimed cabaret performer, keynote speaker and author, actually quadruple threat. I would just make that little change later. Also a self-proclaimed perfectionist, and it is that unrelenting quest for personal betterment that has punctuated his life journey on incredible highs and inexplicable lows. Matthew has battled personal demons, putting an honest, raw account of his struggles in his autobiography, Twists and Turns. He's very open about his life behind the international spotlight, plagued by low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, and his struggles with his sexuality, being one of the few Olympians to compete as an openly gay man. Well done on that, by the way. Matthew Mitchum has proven he has the toughness and impeccable resolve to rise above even the most insurmountable challenges. And ladies and gentlemen, one thing you might not know about the lovely Matthew Mitchum is that he's still proud to say that he's a Spice Girls fan. And his favourite Spice Girl is Mel C, as it is for the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matthew Mitchum. Hello. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. My brief didn't say to be funny, but um, <laughs> I am here. I'm privileged enough to be able to share my lived experience. Um, it's just another story, just like all the others. So hello, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you to the other speakers. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me here at No Offence. I'm Matthew Mitchum. Uh, you may remember me from such Olympic Games as Beijing 2008 and somewhat less memorably London 2012. <laughs> uh, I'm also a university student. Um, I'm majoring in linguistics, like the most useless undergrad ever. Don't do it. Um, I'm also a men's health ambassador. Um, I'm an author, thank you for mentioning that, Twists and Turns. It's available at twistandturns.com.au, thank you very much. Um, and I guess the main reason he, I'm here is because of my history with addiction and alcoholism um, and because Ian Thorpe couldn't make it. <laughs> um, I'm here to share my experiences of depression throughout my teenage years and in my early 20s and how I tried to manage my feelings with self-harm, alcohol and drugs. And you might think, what in the name of Gloria Gaynor would an Olympic gold medalist have to be depressed about? And that's a really important point because some people's depression and anxiety is brought on by traumatic experiences and some people are just genetically predisposed to these illnesses and suffer equally, even if they have the world at their feet. And consequently, they shame themselves because they feel that they have no right to be feeling this way and thus compounding the, the depression, as was in my case. So as a child, I grew up with a single mum whose monthly visits from Auntie Flo seemed to go on for like 27 days of the month, and then she'd be fine for the other three. And this went on for years. She also suffered from depression, she was an alcoholic, and she disciplined me through fear of her wrath. Um, I guess the apple didn't fall far from the tree, actually. <laughs> uh, um, she stayed in bed most days, and she'd go ballistic if I made noise and woke her up. Her bark was bad, but her bite was worse. Like in the car, I would have to sit on the very edge of, my, of the passenger seat as far away from her as I could, constantly in fear that I would inadvertently warrant a smack because, you know, I was angelic and I never did anything to deserve a smack, ever. And whenever she made sudden movements around me, I flinched in self-defense, which made her want to hit me more. <laughs> um, but in spite of this, or perhaps because of it, I yearned for her attention and her approval all the more. I remember distinctly thinking as a child, maybe if I become the best in the world at something, then she'll love me. I loved my mother, but I hated her temperament, and so I promised myself that I would never inflict upon another the rage with which I had been afflicted, aspiring to become the exact opposite of her, and in doing so, I suppressed my anger altogether. But the suppression of this anger would have contributed greatly to the depression I suffered as a teenager. I trudged through half of my teenage years with depression, not doing anything about it or telling anyone because I saw it as a sign of weakness, especially in the macho sporting environment, and I was deeply, deeply ashamed of it. Instead, I resorted to self-harm in a bid to manage my feelings. In my mind, 
then the issue was dealt with and I could move on. What I didn't realise was I was just postponing the problem. After one particular episode, I went far too far and I had to get my poor grandma to come and pick me up and take me to the hospital to get eight stitches. And that's when I decided that, um, that cutting was not an acceptable coping mechanism and so I never did it again. I didn't actually go and fix the problem at all because I was still so ashamed of it, but alcohol actually became my new crutch without me even realising it. And I never enjoyed the process of drinking. I hate the taste and it never made me more social. Every time I drank, I drank to pass out. Diving had a very large part to do with my depression. I saw diving as my only opportunity to be the best in the world at something, my ticket to specialness, the way to get people to like me. I felt like I put all of my eggs in one basket with diving, yet I despised sacrificing so much for it and forcing myself to do something that I was hating for five hours a day, six days a week. And yet I felt like I had no other options because I hadn't acquired any other life skills. I thought resilience was just about toughing it through the hard times. The darkness that shrouded everything to do with diving began to permeate my life outside of the pool. It drove me to attempt suicide twice, both times in my teens. And unfortunately, it wasn't until I was much too miserable to bear that I actually did anything about it, which is always the way, isn't it? <laughs> I retired from diving at the ripe old age of 18 with absolutely no intention of ever returning to the sport. I didn't face my problems. I ran away from them, spending too much time in seedy nightclubs, arc, manacle, you know. <laughs> and taking too many party drugs. It took me six months to stop hating the sport and another three months for me to start missing it. And that's when my current coach, a Mexican man named Chava Sabrino, sent me this SMS saying, if you ever want to start diving again, I'll always have a place in my squad for you. And it was just the way that text was worded, if you ever, in such a nurturing, not pushy way. It was not what I was used to. I knew that this would be the man who could look after me, who cared for my welfare as a human being more than my welfare as an athlete. I think one of the other reasons I was not happy in diving in Brisbane was because I didn't feel entirely comfortable in my own skin within my training squad. Because I'd started diving at such a young age, much too young to have established my sexuality, I never felt comfortable enough to come out to the people I trained with because I felt like that was admitting that I'd been effectively lying to all of these people that I spent all of this time with over the preceding however many years. But I actually believe that holding this aspect back um, caused more problems than it solved because the other athletes in my squad knew that I wasn't being forthright with them and that there were consequently trust issues. So when I moved to Sydney, I made the conscious decision that I was going to be for the first time, absolutely 100% open and honest with everyone I met. This was the perfect opportunity, new city, fresh start. And while at times I may have been a little bit too upfront with people, um, I found that on the whole, people interacted with me in a much better way. Training partners, coaches, work colleagues, divers from other countries, strangers, like everyone. And since making that decision, I've not had a single homophobic experience. I reckon it's because when someone hides an aspect of themselves, people sense that and they don't know where the boundaries are because they don't know what the obstacle is. And when they know the terrain, they know how to navigate it, making for much better interactions. It was kind of like when I was at high school and all of the kids, they smelled that one weakness and so I used to get called a fag all the time until I said, yeah, I'm a fag and it stopped. Apparently, it's not as fun to call a fag a fag when they call themselves one. <laughs> Since being open and comfortable with my sexuality, I've never had more straight mates. In fact, at competitions, the boys make me laugh because apparently it's now become cool to have like a, pl a platonic gay boyfriend. And like they get all possessive over me when they drink. Like it's, it's really, really cute actually. <laughs> Being able to be true to myself and being accepted for it had a profound effect on my self-esteem. When I moved to Sydney, there was only 15 months before the Beijing Games, which is not ideal timing after having had a whole year off. 
But my goal was just to make the Olympic team because, you know, I, it, I never had before. I had unfinished business. And then it was going to be my big gold medal triumphant experience in London. So I was just trying to make the team, that's all. But I trained with such passion and intensity because for the first time in a long time, I was diving because I wanted to, not because I felt like I had to. I was really happy. And we all know what happened in Beijing. I awesomed all over the place. <laughs> Perhaps naively, I thought I was fixed. I was happy, successful, and popular, but it wasn't enough for me. <clears throat> I came to believe that nobody actually liked me. It was just the medal that they liked. My self-esteem needed more bolstering. <clears throat> when I looked on the international diving website at the world rankings, I saw that I was number two in the world because a Chinese diver had won more events earlier in the year than I had. That childhood thought started going around in my mind. I'm still not the best in the world. And all I could think about was seeing myself splashed across the face of every newspaper. Australian diver, one hit wonder, and Matthew Mitchum splash in the pan. I'm very clever in my <laughs> head. <laughs> the motivation to keep training after Beijing was actually quite negative. My self-esteem was so fragile that I'd become completely dependent on the positive feedback from the fans on my social networking pages, or from my coach during training sessions, or from... Um, and my perception of my worth was measured entirely in numbers. How many tens I got from the judges, how many Facebook and Twitter followers I had, how much money I had in the bank, none of which was ever enough when I compared myself to other people. And even when I was ranked number one in the world in 2010, it still wasn't enough. I was still empty. After that, I struggled with injuries for the next year and a half. I couldn't train, I couldn't compete, I lost all sources of that external positive feedback that I'd become so reliant upon. And so I guess it's no surprise, really, that I went straight back to the last coping mechanism that I'd used to medicate my feelings as a teenager, and that was hard drugs, in particular ice. I felt down, I used ice to make myself feel better, and then I would come down and feel worse, and so I would use ice again to make myself feel better, and you know, thus perpetuating and reinforcing the cycle. And I knew that this was a short-term solution that I was using it and that it was exacerbating my situation. But it was the most effective tool I had to change my feelings at the time because I'd never actually addressed any of the problems that I had as a teen, preferring to numb myself instead. And asking anyone for help was the absolute last resort. I felt more ashamed than ever that I'd let myself get to this point. And I felt my problems were unjustified. And it wasn't until it got bad enough that I decided I couldn't fix this one by myself that I finally reached out for help. That was when I realized that I'd been suffering unnecessarily for years. I was 22 before I figured out that I didn't have all the answers like I thought I did. <laughs> there were people who knew better than me, and these were the people that I reached out to. So I checked myself into, re into a rehab center to help me make heads and tails of what was going on. And that's when I learned that the drinking and drugging were a symptom rather than the cause of my depression. That's when I learned that I had such poor self-esteem. That's when I learned how dependent I'd become on all these external things to make myself feel better. I learned that self-esteem should come from within and that all that external positive reinforcement should just be a bonus. I learned that my mental health was my own responsibility and that being proactive about improving my mental health was also a way to improve my self-esteem. I had begun my epic journey towards happiness and healthiness. All this stuff didn't come straight away though. I continued to see a psychologist twice a week for the entire year in the lead up to the London Olympic Games to help deal with other pressures that were affecting me. Like the main one was um, the expectation for me to, to defend my Olympic title, which I was finding was becoming increasingly counterproductive to my preparation. You know, don't worry about it and who cares would have been just as effective as telling someone who's having a panic attack to calm down. We've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> it's happened to me. I've been told to calm down. I just want to fucking slap them. <laughs> so I followed through with the worst case scenario over and over again with the psychologist, finding out what it would mean for me if I didn't defend my title. What would be the worst that would happen? I eventually realized that I'd still have the things that were most important to me and I would be okay even if that scenario were to play out. And that's not to say I had any less anxiety about the worst case scenario playing out at the London Olympic Games. 
In fact, after I messed up my last dive in London, making me miss out on the finals altogether, all of that stinking thinking hit me like a ton of bricks, and I started bawling my eyes out right there on the pool deck, with all of the cameras right up, streaming my tears and snot to televisions all over the world. I hadn't done it. I had sabotaged myself with all of my self-destructive behaviours. My family had spent so much money to come here to watch me. These were just a few of the things that were going around and around in my head and making me sadder and sadder. But within just five minutes, I consciously stopped that counterproductive thinking and pulled myself together since I had to do the walk of shame through the media zone. <laughs> no, I didn't do my best, but I tried my best. I could never have done more in the lead up to the games because of all those injuries. In fact, I should have done much less to have prevented those re-injuries. Yes, my family had spent a lot of money, but they wanted to. And no, I hadn't defended my title, but I was okay. It only took me about six hours of me saying this stuff over and over again for me to actually believe my shit. <laughs> um, but this was the point where I realized that the, all the work that I'd put into my mental health had actually paid off. I didn't have a great big medal hanging around my neck, but I felt like a much happier, healthier person, which actually meant a lot more to me than that win in Beijing. But I kept seeing a psychologist after that because I really think the investment in my mental health has definitely been worth it. The skills I'm developing to help me become a happier person are invaluable. Letting, I mean, the meds really help as well, but you know, <laughs> it's a combination therapy, you know, two-pronged approach. <laughs> Letting go of old resentments because I was the only person suffering from them. Learning the difference between what was within my control and what isn't within my control. And being able to take action on things that I can change or accept the things that I cannot change. And I guess the most important thing is probably learning from my mistakes. I guess that's my idea of what a good role model is. Not someone who never makes mistakes because, frankly, that's a bit unrealistic. I think that's called religion. Ooh. <laughs> no, my idea of a role model is someone who learns, changes, evolves. That's what I try to do. That's why I'm not ashamed to talk about all my defects of character. I'm not ashamed of the drugs and alcohol. I'm not ashamed that drugs and alcohol are still a part of my life every day, but in a positive way, a couple of years clean and sober, um, because I get to help people by sharing my story. And the more I share my story, the more we all share our stories, the more it helps to break down the stigma surrounding mental health that prevented me from reaching out when I was a teenager. So I can't stress enough the importance of reaching out as a first resort, not a last one. The, how many years is it now? Three, the three years since London, um, I have probably been the most productive. Um, it's funny what you can do when you're happy and your head is screwed on properly, hey. I, realized, I released my picture book, otherwise known as an autobiography. Um, thank you for mentioning that. It's called Twists and Turns. Again, you can get a signed, personalized copy from twistsandturns.com.au. Um, and then I adapted it into a cabaret show because I'm really milking my story for all it's worth. <laughs> A cabaret show of the same name um, that's toured Australia um, and has actually won Best Cabaret of Perth Fringe last year. Um, it's in its second um, year of touring and it provides me with so much pleasure and joy to share my story but to also give permission for other people to share what's going on for them after each show. Um, what's next? Um, I thought I was going to retire after London. Um, what with all those injuries and everything. And then I was definitely gonna retire after Glasgow last year, but then I did really well, so um, I've decided to push on to Rio next year because, you know, Rio. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just wanna finish with something that's probably more relevant to the subject matter of tonight, no offense, taking the stigma out of language. Um, there was this real phenomenon I noticed a couple of years ago of young kids saying when something was crap, they'd go, that is so gay. And I, while personally I wasn't offended by it, I thought there are so many people who've worked so hard for me to be as comfortable with my sexuality as I am, and those people probably would be very, very offended by it. So rather than um, lampooning them, <laughs> Um, I tried to think of how I could get them to think about what they were saying. And so, rather than, whenever they said, that's so gay, I would say, you mean in a bad way, because 
this is gay in a good way. <laughs> and that's gay in a bad way. And it really, it caught on actually. Um, and so whenever the kids would start saying, oh, that's so gay in a bad way, and then they just started saying it less. And, and now I hardly ever notice them saying it at all. And if they do ever say it, they do add in a bad way. So uh, I guess it's small actions like that that um, are really heartening to see change. Thank you very much. Matthew Mitchum, ladies and gentlemen. Definitely not gay in a bad way. Absolutely not. Um, you are adorable. <laughs> no offence, but he is the most adorable person in this room. I just want to, like, cuddle you. Um, how old are you now? 27. And you have learned that much at the age of 27. Dude, you are so far ahead of the pack. Like, seriously, that is an amazing journey. Um, I feel like I should say I'm proud of you. <laughs> like, I just met you, but I'm really proud of you. I really am. And it's very interesting listening to you as a public figure. Um, before I walked into this room, if you'd said to me, who's Matthew Mitchum, I would have gone, he's that gold medalist. And then probably, oh, you know, he's the one who had the courage to come out and he was great. I think there was something to do with drugs, but, you know, that would have been how I described you. The mismatch between... The external and the internal is one of the biggest things, that, one of the biggest challenges I think we have to talk about as consumers or lived experience or whatever to try and break through that and get people to understand and you're doing that. So thank you very much. Um, I have to mention a couple of other things because my head's going um, and that is a couple of things struck me. One is that one of the things that has to be injected into the conversation I think is the social determinants of mental illness. Um, one of those being homophobia and there's various other things that we could all talk about. I think it's a real problem to individualise discussions of mental illness and to not recognise that some aspects of our society are sick and make people sick, one of them being homophobia. Um, and another one is that, and I've found this in my own experience, some aspects of um, mental illness are rewarded. And you were rewarded for extreme perfectionism, which is also played out as being part of your illness, it sounds like. Um, it might be overwork, it might be drinking, it might be obsessive kinds of behaviours, it might be black and white thinking, um, all of those kinds of things, especially in workplaces. If you're the one with anxiety, you are working 14 hours a day. You will not leave until it's done. And that is rewarded until you can't work anymore. And we need to talk about that, not just about what Nellie's doing or Matthew's doing or anyone else is doing. What are we doing as a society to be healthy? All right, I'm getting on my soapbox. Forgive me.